bright up here. So how's everybody doing? This was a very powerful presentation. I, and you can see uh, you know, how important um, sustainability uh, and climate change um, and all the other things that when we talk about sustainability really affect us. Um, I wanted to talk to you about, and kind of closing the session today, I wanted to talk to you about uh, one of the biggest challenges that humankind is facing over the next few generations, which is climate change. And the role our buildings and our communities and cities actually play in helping us um, re refashion and redesign uh, uh, our cities, our buildings, and then also mitigate uh, and build, uh, have communities that are more resilient to climate change. Um, is this working? Yes. Um, and what I want to talk to you particularly about is um, the role of um, zero carbon buildings. So buildings that will not emit greenhouse gas emissions. And why is that important? So this is a chart from uh, environment and climate change. Um, and that shows the carbon emissions or greenhouse gas emissions in Canada. So we see there three scenarios that uh, kind of depict on how uh, our greenhouse gas emissions will what they look like 5, 10, 15 years from now leading up to 2030. In none of those curves, the climate change emissions are pointing down. They continue to go up, and then you see two dots. You see one dot at 2020, and you see one dot at 2030. That's where we need to go. But it's certainly not the direction we're going into right now. And so the question is, what will it take to bend this curve down? Because we do a lot of talking, we do a lot of planning, but this curve, like the curve in so many other countries around across the world, is not pointing down, it's continuing to go up. And an individual called Es Masria, some time ago, I created what's called the, uh, the, uh, the uh, 2030 Challenge. He's an architect, and he basically is still working on a, uh, an approach and shows how we need to design buildings to step down what he calls his carbon neutral buildings. I call it zero carbon buildings, so buildings that don't emit, uh, don't emit any emissions, but carbon neutral buildings. Uh, how, what we need to do in terms of improving energy efficiency, renewable energy, and how we're gonna get rid of fossil fuels over time. What you see here where it says today, that was in 2015. And today, which is 2017, I can certainly not say that we're designing our buildings to be 70% more efficient than what they were in 2005 or before. So we're clearly not keeping up with the things that we need to do, which means that we have to start being more radical. We need to be way more radical about and more disruptive about what's, what, is it, what is it that is going to get us to this kind of low carbon, zero carbon future. And one of the things is, we actually need to change our language. And our language right now is when we, uh, we actually refer to energy, when we actually shouldn't be talking about carbon. We think that automatically, if we turn our thermostat down in our homes, we are emitting less carbon. Unfortunately, unfortunately, that's not necessarily the case. So one example to illustrate that is, if you have two buildings, that are identical, they have the same level of energy efficiency, exactly the same. One is heated with natural gas, which is a fossil fuel, and the other one is heated with electricity. So the entire building is run with electricity, heated, lighted, everything, and the other one with natural gas. And the electricity comes here in Quebec, you have very clean hydropower. It's 95% carbon free. The building with the natural gas emits 36 times as much carbon emissions than the one that you would power with a clean energy source. So that clearly plays a big role in how we now, moving forward, designing our building or retrofitted our buildings. 
energy efficiency is not enough. We need to speak the language of carbon. <coughs> and we feel that this is very disruptive, but maybe it's not as disruptive as we think, because uh, 10 other countries, 10 other councils in the world are working on the same thing as we speak. Actually, Australia just launched its uh, carbon standard with the, in concert with its federal government as a standard that um, Australia aspires to. So this is happening all over the world, and Canada is an uh, innovator in this space, and we're moving this initiative forward with zero-carbon buildings. So what is a zero-carbon building? So again, it is a mixture between energy efficiency. You need energy efficiency because um, uh, you cannot supply a sufficient amount of renewable energy if your building is very inefficient. Renewable energy is not like fossil fuel. When you need more, you burn more. It's not like that. Um, so you need a balance between energy efficiency and then you need to find a way to use renewable energy, either renewable energy being hydro, solar, uh, wind, uh, sometimes you can uh, take energy and, and heat from, from the ground. And you need to use that energy then to replace any of the fossil fuels that they're using in that building. And there are really four strategies here that we're looking at. One is zero carbon balance. The next one is efficiency. The third one is renewable energy. And the fourth one is low carbon materials. So I want to briefly talk to you about those four areas to really frame your thinking. And I was thinking collectively what zero carbon building is actually going to look like. So the zero carbon balance is, we really need to have a zero carbon balance in terms of operating a building over the course of the entire year. So you cannot just uh, take one month or one week because you light or heat your buildings depending on the seasons. So in the winter you have the lights on more often, in the summer you put your cooling on, particularly in Montreal, and so on. So you really need to look over the course of the year. And there might be times during the year where you actually have to rely on, on fossil fuel to heat your building because there's just so much demand. But you need to make sure that at the end of the year, you are at zero. So it's, a, it's an annual process that you need to look at. So it needs to be balanced across the year. The second one is efficiency. Um, and efficiency really focuses in zero carbon buildings on two things. Is you need uh, what we call the building envelope. The building envelope is the walls, the windows, the roofs. They need to be highly, highly efficient. They need to be super efficient, super insulated. Um, what that does is um, it keeps the heat in um, or it keeps the cold out, depending again on the time of the year. Um, but you need a very efficient envelope. And then you need to have very efficient ventilation. So you really you need to control um, like how much air comes in, how much air goes out, and actually the air that goes out, the warm air that goes out, uh, warms the cool air coming in. So you have systems and technologies that are really starting to play. It's not just uh, you know, the envelope, but also the equipment that you use in a building um, to really get to very high levels of energy efficiency. And that's really the basis, because what I said before, you need these high levels of energy efficiency that to make up and replace the remaining amount of fossil fuels you're using to power your house or your home or your, um, your, your community and your city. So the third one, which is really the one where we talk about renewable energy. And really, uh, uh, there, there these three forms, as I mentioned, there's solar, there is uh, wind, there's ground source heat uh, that, uh, that is being used. But renewable energy is a it's a trickier business than you think. Because people say, well, you know, what's the big deal? So I'll I have a house, I'll put some solar on my roof, maybe enough solar, and then I'm good. Well, not necessarily. Because what happens is, is <coughs> the solar is being produced during the day when you're not home. And, but you come home then, and you want to turn the lights on, you put the heat on, do all kinds of things. But then the solar doesn't actually, actually work anymore because the sun has gone down. So we actually still need to work, and there are many people working on what we call energy storage. So you can actually match, uh, match your generation to in the time you need that energy uh, in home at work. 
And also, for example, if you use solar, let's say instead of office buildings, I want an office building that would work. Uh, because I'm there during the day, the sun is out during the day, so I'm good. Well, not necessarily. Because office buildings have actually a very small footprint and they're very tall. And they consume a lot of energy. But you would only have a small roof space to put your solar on. To power that building. Generate lighting, maybe heat during the day. So, um, by renewable energy is the solution, we need to look beyond just uh, the building site into um, uh, purchases of uh, clean energy, renewable energy, that's generated across the country. So it will take us some time to generate our electricity and our energy on site. There's certainly technologies available, uh, but these also need to be economical. And in the meantime, just like a hybrid car, you still need a little bit of gas, to get off the fossil fuels, the same with buildings. And finally, low carbon materials. Uh, particularly when it comes to the structure of the building, we use, uh, or the envelope of the building as well, we use wood, uh, we use concrete, uh, we use steel, look out the window. It's, it's all materials that um, uh, uh, we build these, uh, we're building these cities. And so, in terms of the materials, you need to look at materials to reduce the carbon footprints of these materials. Um, we're seeing now buildings being built called tall wood buildings. These are mass timber buildings to go up to 20, 30 stories built out of wood. And why wood? Because wood, if you all paid attention in biology class, you know that when a tree grows, they take carbon out of the atmosphere and you bind this carbon in the wood fiber. So when you use wood, you actually have a carbon positive material because it takes carbon out of the atmosphere. You see innovations now in cement, where they do the same thing in cement making, where they take carbon out of the atmosphere and have actually cement products that are moving towards carbon positivity. So there are all these types of innovation where you're starting to see it's the operating energy that you need, but also how you build your buildings and where those materials uh, are coming from. So you're starting to have a whole um, you drive not only like uh, environmental sustainability, but you're driving a whole um, uh, trend, a whole innovation in our economy in terms of products, in terms of services, and in terms of technologies. Now, in this program that we have, we have 16 projects across the country in different sizes, uh, from 60-story office towers to uh, wastewater treatment, uh, office buildings, retrofits to um, uh, uh, university buildings, and I wanted to show you a couple. So you really see in a practical application what zero, or, uh, uh, zero carbon buildings, what that actually means. So this is one, this is a, a fire hall in the, in the city of Vancouver, uh, that's currently under design. And again, that building will have be super insulated, um, and, then, and it uses clean hydropower in BC, it's just like Quebec, very clean energy source. And then it uses a solar on, uh, on the rooftop to make up any remaining fossil fuels. And the city of Vancouver wants to use this project as a, as a demonstration project then to revise its policy for its own buildings to build every building to that standard. And that really, when you think about it, that's the challenge. It's not just one building or two buildings, it's, we need scale. We need a big scale of these buildings uh, across the country and across the world. The other building is um, this building here, it's Mohawk College. It's a little bit different because it relies a little bit more on renewable energy generation. It also has also an, a, a very um, efficient envelope, maybe not as efficient as the first one, but it, you, it looks uh, to a larger component of renewable energy. So for example, it uses ground, what we call um, ground source heat pumps or geothermal, so they basically pump liquid into the ground because the ground has constant temperature and you use that to heat or cool the building over, uh, over the course of the year. You have a lot of solar, and that's where you see the sandwich roof, you have a lot of solar on that roof to help power that building uh, during the day and, uh, uh, and supply energy to the building. So these are uh, they have, uh, the targeting similar outcomes, but the approaches, as you can see, are quite different. Um, and this is a building out at UBC that was built many years ago. Um, that attempted to achieve, uh, to be carbon positive. It's called, uh, you can see the name, I don't have to repeat it, 
um, a carbon positive building. And what did they do? It's probably in operation about five years now. It's a research institute into sustainability. And you can see one of the thing is, you see in this picture here, was one of the first buildings was built with wood. So with massive wood. Again, the wood sequesters carbon. They were attempting a carbon positive building. And you also see in that picture, that building is daylit. And it's a, to our standards, it's 100% daylit. It means you're reducing your use of electricity and of, uh, for lighting uh, and make use of the daylight. And what's designed in process and shape that it has um, and the window surfaces and so on to be 100% daylit. The building also um, uses various forms of energy. So it uses waste tea from an adjacent building with a pipe. I'm simplifying a little bit, but he uses waste heat. The other building, which is vent, uses that to heat the building. It again has uh, a geothermal, a ground source heat pump system. And it also has solar. So it has solar cells embedded in the windows of the building. And here on the roof, you can see it also has uh, solar to preheat water. So it attempted to use a lot of technology to get to a low carbon, zero carbon kind of performance. I would certainly say they achieved it in terms of materials, but in terms of the operations, they ended up being uh, not quite there yet. They're about, maybe they use about 60 kilowatt hours per square meter per year, which is excellent for building, but it's not zero carbon. So you can see, doing these buildings is definitely possible um, uh, in, in, in Canada. And if we now, just to finish off, if between now and 2030, we build every building, every larger building, so every building of about 25,000 square feet, if we build it to zero carbon, we would eliminate 7.5 billion tons of carbon. And from those, from that size, of it is about, uh, the 70% is not all the buildings we have in terms of reduction, but the 70% represents uh, a, a, a reduction from, this, from this, these larger buildings that were over 25,000 square feet. So the potential to eliminate carbon to a kind of zero carbon bush is significant. <laughs> the question is, is it possible? Is it possible because it's almost 2018, we have 12 years left, is it possible? And I think it is possible from the technology point of view, <coughs> Um, but I think the timing is definitely against us. There's no doubt it's against us. We are um, finding a bit of an uphill battle there. And I just want to leave you with that final thought is that we need to do a little bit more of a... Oh, it took my last slide. But anyway, um, we need to be a little more, more drastic in how we think about getting there. Um, and I had, a, I had a slide in there of Muhammad Ali. Who of you knows Muhammad Ali? Everyone. I'm surprised actually, because he, is a, he was very famous when I was, uh, when I was a child. And he was not just the best boxer that ever existed, but he was also a social activist. He refused to fight in the, in the Vietnam War. He, um, he did not, um, he converted to, Muslim, uh, to Islam. He, uh, he, was, he supported the civil rights movement in, in the United States. He had a big mouth. In other words, he was non-conforming. Let's say non-conforming. But he said he saw something that's not possible as an opportunity. And he said, you know, um, uh, in, uh, impossible is opportunity. Um, impossible is temporary and will pass. We never thought he was going to send a man to the moon, and we did. It's temporary. And he said, impossible is nothing. And I would say that uh, reaching our climate change goals is also nothing. We can do this. Thank you very much. For you.